Why don't we go ahead and stand as we now prepare to hear the word of God. Father, into your presence we come, dear sir, to praise and to worship and to adore you. We say this is the day that you have made, and we will honor you. Thank you for giving us Jesus, and thank you for giving us the precious Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you'll rise up big within me now, that you'll think through my mind and speak through my lips of clay. And I declare that I'm a servant, ready to be used by the Master. I thank you that I'll speak your word clearly, accurately, carried by the wind of the Spirit, that fear will be dispelled, but faith will rise up in the heart of your people, and we here at Christian Family Church, we are not only hearers of your word, but we are doers of the word, and therefore we have good success in life. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Greet someone, say it's good to have you in the house. Welcome to our online family, and happy, happy Mother's Day to all those watching online. President Woodrow Wilson said on May the 9th, 1914, when Congress declared the second Sunday in May as Mother's Day, he said, this day has been set aside as a time of expression of our love and reverence for the mothers of our country. Since then, Mother's Day has spread to across many nations of the world, and I'm so glad it did. I'm sure you will agree with me when I say it's the mothers who nurture us, guide us, and teach us our valuable lessons in life. It's true when they say that mother's love knows no bounds and her strength knows no limits. So for those of us who have taken on the role of motherhood, whether a natural mother, adoptive mother, stepmother, foster mother, grandmother, or spiritual mother, we want to express our love, our gratitude for your guidance and sacrifice of unwavering love and your support that you give to your families every single day. How many of us will say that mothers wear so many hats, right? And here are some of them. There you go. We've got teacher, financial planner, laundry organizer, housekeeper, chauffeur, chef, Nurse, event planner, counselor, referee, peacemaker, personal shopper, menu planner, storyteller, entertainer, and I'm sure there are many more hats that a woman wears. I read uh, recently about a story about a wealthy son who wanted to give his mother something really special and extraordinary on Mother's Day. So he happened to walk past a pet shop one day, and he heard a bird whistling Amazing Grace. He thought, well, that's a pretty incredible gift that I could uh, buy for my mom. What an unusual bird. He went inside the pet shop and inquired about the bird. The pet owner told him that not only did the bird whistle Amazing Grace, but he could recite the 23rd Psalm. That clinched the deal. Even though the bird was $10,000, he bought it for his mom. As he lived far away, he shipped the bird just in time for Mother's Day. On Mother's Day, he called his mom and he said, Mom, happy Mother's Day. I love you. I appreciate you. Did you love the bird I sent? Yes, thank you, son. It was delicious. <laughs> Well, I thought it was a hilarious joke. My husband said, Beverly. <laughs> so let's try this one. Did you hear about the husband who woke up one morning and his wife said, honey, do you know what day it is? Of course I do. That's what they always say when they don't know, right? <laughs> of course. It's like, yes, dear, of course I do. Well, he was bothered at work all day. What kind of day is this? So he decided to make sure that he wouldn't miss out on the special day. He bought a bouquet of red roses for his wife. He even made a reservations for dinner for two at her favorite restaurant. And on the way home, he, uh, when he got home, he gave her the flowers. And then he said to her, get your best dress on. We're going out for a romantic dinner for two. Well, after the dinner, she was just loving the, all the attention she was getting. She got roses, she got dinner. And then he said, 
Well, honey, did you enjoy the special day? Yes, she said. Thank you. This was the best Groundhog Day ever. <laughs> How many of us have got grandchildren? Can I see your hands? Don't they say the darndest things, right? Well, when Uriah was 12, he's with us this morning. He is now 13. But when he was 12, he went to a private Christian school. And of course, because he is so darn good looking, just like his father and grandfather, the girls swarm around him. And uh, they like bees to honey, and he has to fend them off all the time. So one day, uh, one of his friends came to him and said, Uriah, this one girl loves you so much. She wants to be your friend. She wants your number. And uh, will you, you know, make friends with her? So Uriah said, look, I'm not here for girls. I'm here to get a good education and to excel in sports because he's such a good sportsman, just like his brother Troy. He said, the friend said, Uriah, this girl's going to feel brokenhearted. She's going to feel rejected. You don't want to hurt her feelings, do you? Uriah said, please, this is not my first rodeo. <laughs> Twelve. Oh, chip off the old block. <laughs> and one day we were driving with some of our grandchildren and we were listening to Christian radio uh, in the car and a song came up that we liked. And so we said to my husband, oh, um, babe, do you like the song? And then Apostle Theo said, no, I don't like that song. <laughs> so Ella, who was eight at the time, she says, granddad, don't let the devil lie to you. This same grandchild was listening to a conversation in our car when we were driving with Natalie, and we were telling about a challenge we had overcome. Obviously, it wasn't a big challenge, otherwise we wouldn't be speaking in front of our grandchildren, but we were just giving praise about this challenge we had overcome, and, and so the same grandchild said, Granddad, how did you let the devil get from under your feet? Because isn't that where the devil's meant to be, under our feet? But as we honor our mothers today, let's reflect on stories of mothers in the Bible and the challenges they faced. And by considering their experiences, we can learn some life lessons. And the title of my message is Life Lessons from Mothers in the Bible. The poet John Milton said, Eve was the fairest of all creation. Genesis 1.27 says, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So God had been busy for six days, creating a beautiful new world. The stage was set and the magnificent scenery stood, finished. His sun, his moon and the stars lighted up the perfect creation. Of course, God made Adam first, and Adam was made from the dust of the ground. And then finally and dramatically, all of the universe stood at attention, waiting God's final masterpiece. But before I tell you about the final masterpiece, I want to tell you about a, a story I heard when an angel was talking to God about why God was taking so long with his final masterpiece. And the Lord asked the angel, well, have you read the spec sheet on her? She has to be completely washable, not plastic. She has to have more than 200 moving parts. She's got to run on black coffee and leftovers. She's got to have a lap that can hold at least three children at a time. She's got to have a kiss that can cure anything from a scraped knee to a broken heart. She's got to have six pairs of hands. The angel was astounded by uh, the requirements for this one. And the Lord went on. That's not all. She needs to have three pairs of eyes, one in the front and two in the back, to see what the kids are up to. She's also going to have ears that can hear through walls. She's got to be soft. She's got to be tough. She's got to have a heart that loves unconditionally and, and forgives freely. 
She must be able to reason and think and negotiate. And not, that, not only that, but she's got to be able to feed a family of six on a pound of hamburger. Wow, the angel exclaimed. Who can do that? And God said, that's why I kept her for last, because she can and she will, because she is a woman. It was only after God presented his masterpiece, woman, that he proclaimed that creation was very good. We see in Genesis 3.20, it says, Then Adam named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all people everywhere. So she was a mother of all humankind. She had the distinction of being the first woman, the first wife, and the first mother. She was the only mother without a mother and a father. She was made by God as a reflection of his image to be a helper to Adam. And together, they were meant to fulfill the purposes, the plans that God had for them by populating the earth and subduing it. But we know the story, Satan, our enemy, tempted, tempted Eve and got her to doubt God's word. And since then, his strategy hasn't changed, has it? He even tried to get Jesus to doubt God's word about who he was in the wilderness. To Jesus, he said, if you are the son of God, and to Eve, he said, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So this question of doubt planted in her heart about God's word. And Satan is, hasn't changed. He will try and get us to doubt God's word today. So it's so important for us to meditate in his word, read the word of God, so we don't fall into temptation or doubt the word of God. Now, Eve, she forgot all about the good things that God had given her in the garden. And although she shared an up-close and personal relationship with, with God himself and her husband, she failed to consult either of them when she was confronted with Satan's suggestions. In fact, she acted independently and impulsively. She, once she was entangled in sin, she invited her husband to join her. And the sad thing is, he did. And after the price of their decision, they were expelled from the Garden of Eden. But after they left the garden, there was no indication that God spoke to them on a personal level like he did before. We have no further words from Adam, but we have two further statements from Eve. Genesis 4, 1 says, Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. So she had not forgotten where her help came from, and she had not forgotten God's love and his mercy to her. But now that Eve was a mother, she had the responsibility, as someone who personally knew God, to pass her knowledge of God to her children. And isn't that our responsibility today as parents, that we should train our children in the way they should go? So when they're old, they will not depart from it. In fact, God gives us instruction with a promise in Proverbs 22, verse 6. He says just that, train, train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And the second statement we find from Eve is found in Genesis 4:25. Adam lay with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel, since Cain killed him. So Eve, the first woman in the Bible, the first mother in the Bible, understood sorrow and grief and loss when her son committed the first recorded murder in the Bible. She understood pain. She understood loss. And so for all those mom watching online or in the house today, if you've lost a child, we want you to know that God understands your heartache. And he said that he'll heal the brokenhearted. He'll bind up your wounds. In fact, Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Trust in the Lord. He understands and loves you very much. And so do we. So what lessons can we learn from the mom Eve? 
Well, even though she made wrong choices in life, even though she failed God, Eve knew that God would not fail her. Isn't that a good news? Even if we make a mistake, we know God will never fail us. She knew God would comfort her in the time of sorrow. She knew that she could trust in his love and his mercy. And the good news is, family, when we make mistakes, we too can trust in the love of God. When we say, Father, forgive us, he forgives us, he helps us, he puts us on the right path, he will restore us, he will never reject us because we serve a merciful God. And then, as you trace a genealogy, the family line through the Old and New Testament, we see that Jesus comes through the line of Seth. Eve's son, the mercy of God. Unfortunately, her legacy is that she persuaded her husband to go right out the will of God. So Adam and Eve changed the course of history for every human being. As I was studying this, I was talking to my husband. I said, Theo, just think about this. When God made the first man, the first woman, the first couple, they blew it. The first couple made mistakes. The first couple succumbed to doubt. The first couple sinned. The first couple never fulfilled the will of God for their life. I said to my husband, why would God make more people if he made the very two and they didn't even make it? They blew it. The very first two blew it. Why in the world would God make more? Is that a fair question? Yeah. And he said, because God the Father wanted a family to live with him in heaven, people who have a free will who would choose to love and obey him. And you know, even though God made us in spite of us, he knew we were going to make mistakes, he knew we were going to blow it, but he loves us still. If we just say, Father, forgive us, he puts us right on track. He restores us. That's the goodness of God. And to solve God's, uh, the problem of man's failure, God decided ahead of time that he would send his son to the cross before creation. And this would give us an opportunity to be forgiven of our sins and to accept Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for your kindness. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy towards us. The next mother we're going to look at is Sarah. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, as she couldn't have any children. So in Genesis 17, 15, it says, God also said to Abraham, now listen to this family, so important. He says, as for Sarai, your wife, you're no longer to call her Sarah. Her name is going to be Sarah. So God changed her name to Sarah. Okay, so God is saying to Abraham, he's talking to Abraham, Abraham, I will bless her. Abraham, I will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. So God said, Abraham, I'm going to give you a son through Sarah. I'm going to bless her. I'm going to, she's going to be the mother of nations. So God called Sarah the mother of nations while Eve was a mother of all living humans. But you know, when God told Abram he was going to have a son in his old age, the Bible tells us that Abram fell face down. He laughed to himself and he said, what will a son be born to a man? He's I'm 100 years old. Come on, God. And will Sarah, will she bear a child at the age of 90? Genesis 21, 2 says, Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abram in his old age at the very time God had promised him. And Sarah said, God has brought me laughter. And everyone who hears about this will laugh or rejoice with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have born a son in his old age. One of the most challenging times of a Christian's life is developing patience. And how many of us say that is the truth? especially if we're believing God for something and it's taking longer than we hoped for. 
We live in an age of instant nails, instant hair, instant coffee, instant hey Siri, Google, right? Everything is instant. So patience is what we lack, but patience is what we need. Hebrews 6.12 says that through faith and patience, we inherit the promises of God. So we must remember that when we're praying for something, believing God for something, that a delay is not a denial. But unfortunately, one way we often cope with a long wait is we think we're going to help God. We're going to get his plan going. We're going to maybe help him uh, fix it up because he's taking too long. And this was the approach of Sarah. She thought in the natural, you know, I'm too old to have a child. So God must have something else in mind. So from her limited point of view, because now she's like old, she thought Abraham could never give me a son through my own body. So God maybe is thinking uh, he'll give me a, a son through another woman because in those days it was a common practice for a man to have more than one wife or concubines. How crazy is that? Well, Abraham, as I said, is the father of our faith. And as I read over and over again, that God spoke to Abraham and said, Abraham, Sarah is going to give you a son. I'm going to bless her. Remember we read that? So we know that God himself spoke to Abraham. So when here comes Sarah concocting her own plan, trying to fix things, I mean, how many of us have ever tried to help God with his plan? I put my both hands up. We've all tried to fix it, make it, plan it right. We've all tried to, okay, God, you're taking too long. I'm going to fix it for you. I mean, I've done it. I remember when my girls were, when my girls were not serving the Lord, I thought, Lord, if you don't hurry up and get them saved and get, well, they were saved, but they were backslidden. So I did everything. I had a home, I had a home group every single week. I would get the worst people to come in and talk to them, like Satanists, so who have been in, come, who come out, you know, those kind of people. Even the, the guy who smoked so much, he had no voice, uh, he, had no, he had a little cube in there. I would guess so they, they wouldn't smoke. I mean, I just got the, the most kind of radical people to try and get these kids on the straight and narrow. Well, that didn't work. So we've often tried. It's only prayer that really worked. But, so we've all tried in our own ability to hurry up God's plan. And so she thought, okay, I'm going to present this, this uh, woman to Abraham. Now, when she said, Abraham, my beloved husband, the father of our faith, here I'm giving you another woman. I present you Hagar. She's my servant. You can go sleep with her tonight, and then she can give me a child. Now, you know Abraham would have said, wait a minute, Sarah. I'm the head of this home. I'm the father of faith. I'm the authority in this home. God spoke to me and he said, uh, you are going to give me a child. Didn't say anything about Hagar. So no, uh, um, reject your plan. But a father of our faith never did. He said, well, Sarah, if you really want me to go with this other woman tonight, well, come on, Hagar, let's go. I have zip my lip. <laughs> at, the plan worked at first, but as we read later, the plan was a disaster. And we, I wonder how many times Sarah must have regretted the day she tried to fulfill God's will in her own ability instead of trusting God to do it for her. So one thing we can learn from Sarah's life is not to rush ahead and try and fulfill God's plan for our lives and try and do it in our own ability. But we should rather trust God to do it for us. The second lesson we can learn from Sarah's life is she teaches us when we're doubtful or afraid that we should remember what God said to Abraham in Genesis 8.14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And so Sarah's life reminds us that when we are believing God, when we are praying for something, we must not lose hope. We must not give up. A, a delay is not a denial. God is working. We must hold fast our confession of faith without doubt, a doubting, without wavering, because God is faithful and he will bring his promises to pass. Father, Abraham is called the father of our faith, and therefore we can say Sarah is the mother of of our faith. Now I want us to consider two mothers 
the last two mothers we're going to look at today, whose choices impacted generations to come. And as parents, we can see that our choices will impact generations to come. And as I was studying this, I really felt like they really impacted my life. Of course, I admire every mother in the Bible, but these two have a special place in my heart. The first mother we're going to look at is Moses' biological mother. And does anybody know her name? Jochebed. Jochebed. What a feminine name. <laughs> Sorry, Jochebed. I'm glad that name is not around today. But nevertheless, she was Moses' biological mother. Now, do you know that Moses was born in a dark period in history when Pharaoh sought to wipe out the Jewish race through genocide? Do you remember the Egyptian king? He commanded the mid midwives to, all the baby boys, all the Jewish boys who were born, that they, they had to uh, be murdered and killed. Remember that? But despite this decree, the Jewish women were blessed by the Lord, and they multiplied, and Jochebed had a beautiful baby boy. And so she hid him for three months, knowing that her entire family could be destroyed if she was caught. But after three months, Moses' parents made a decision to trust God with their precious son. And here's a lesson we can all learn right here. Trust our children to God. So Moses' mother creatively made papyrus basket and she laid him in the reeds of the Nile River under the watchful eye of his sister. And of course, we know that's Miriam. And we see the account in Exodus 2 verse 1. It says, during this time, a man and woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw what a beautiful baby and kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the river Nile. The baby sister then stood at a distance, watching to see what would happen to him. Soon after this, one of Pharaoh's daughters came down to bathe in the river, and her servant girls walked along the river bank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she told one of her servant girls, to get it for her. As the princess opened it, she found the baby boy. His helpless cries touched her heart, and he said, he must be one of the Hebrew children. Then the baby sister approached the princess, should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you, she asked. Yes, do, the princess replied. So the girl rushed home and called the baby's mother. But the question I have for all of us today did Pharaoh's daughter coincidentally find herself at the river bathing at the precise moment when Moses cried in the basket? Was it a mere coincidence or was this another part of God's great plan to rescue the Jewish nation? Just like when Joseph, an obscure figure, rose to power, Remember, under another pharaoh during a severe famine. Ultimately, it was Joseph who saved Israel as God brought him into the spotlight. And now God's doing it again. He did an unexpected figure, brought her to the spotlight in the former Egyptian princess. And she played a crucial role in the survival of Israel. Now, the Bible doesn't give us her name. We don't know her name. But we know that she felt great compassion for Moses when she heard him cry and she drew him out the water. Of course, we know that Miriam, his sister, rushed to her and said, would you like me to find a Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you? And we read that the Pharaoh's daughter said, yes, take the child, find a Hebrew woman to nurse the child for me. When the child is weaned, bring him back to me and I will pay her. So then Miriam was able to take Moses, her brother, to his natural mother, Jochebed, who, we, who, who fed him and nursed him for three years. In those days, they, they nursed him for about three years. And so during those three years, she had time to pour everything about God into his life. But Jochebed was an amazing woman because when this child was weaned, she kept 
her word. And she gave her son to another woman to raise. What an amazing mom. She gave her son to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted Moses as her own son. And you know, it was Moses' daughter who actually named him Moses, meaning I drew him out the water. By adopting Moses, she saved him from death and provided 40 years of protection. She gave him the finest education any child could ever dream of. He learned mathematics, he learned writing, he learned literature, Egyptian law and Egyptian history, all while he's under the care of his adoptive mother. But it's interesting to note, listen to this family, who wrote the first five books of the Bible, the Torah? It was Moses. Where did he learn to write? In Egypt, under his adoptive mother's care. His adoptive mother didn't even realize she was giving him the tools to be able to write the Bible, the first five books of the Bible. What an incredible thought. What an incredible mother. He wrote that while he was at Mount Sinai. So his adoptive mother groomed him to be a future leader. She gave him the tools that was necessary to be a great success. She loved Moses, and her influence on him led to the survival of the entire nation. So his natural mother and adoptive mother were influential, and their boundless love and their sacrifice for their son remains immeasurable even today. But let's have a look at just some very short lessons from Jochebed, Moses' mom. Number one, faith and trust in God. She demonstrated strong faith when she placed her son in the river, believing that God would protect him all the days of his life. And this act of faith inspires us today to trust God's plan for our children's lives, even in challenging times. She also showed immense courage by defying Pharaoh's orders she didn't allow her son to be killed. So her courage teaches us the importance of standing up for what is right, even in the face of adversity. And three, her love for her son was sacrificial and so deep. What amazed me about Jochebed, she was willing to do whatever it took to protect her son, even if it was meant letting him go. She was willing to let him go and trust God that he would be safe in God's hands. It's hard for us as parents to watch our children grow. I'm sure you agree with me. See them make their own path in life, forge their own way, go to college, university, Bible school, make their own life. It's hard for us, but we have to trust God, put our children in his hands, trusting that God is going to lead them and guide them, knowing that God will, that they will be safe in his hands. Okay, let's have a look at some lessons from Pharaoh's daughter. Number one, we've got to learn the lesson that Pharaoh's daughter showed incredible compassion for someone else's child when she drew him from the river Nile. She displayed remarkable acceptance of raising Moses as her own son, regardless of his Hebrew heritage, as she was a Gentile. So we too can learn to accept and love others regardless of their background, their heritage, or circumstances. She was also a great woman of courage, just like Jochebed. Despite the risks involved in defying her father's decree to kill all the Hebrew babies, she courageously chose to raise Moses as her own child. So both she and Jochebed remind us that our actions and our choices have the potential to leave a positive legacy for our children. How we raise our children and how we influence them may impact many generations to come. How many of you will say to me, parenting is not for the faint-hearted, right, family? Yeah. It is not. Yeah. Parenting is a profound journey that extends beyond the bounds of time. So as we raise our children, we are not just shaping their present selves, but we're planting seeds of greatness in them for their future. 
every bedtime story that you tell your child, every scraped knee that you tend to, every late night of, of homework contributed to, every gentle word of encouragement, every time you guide your child, it influences their lives. So our legacy as parents is not measured by material wealth. And my husband and I have spoken about this so many times. Our legacy is not measured by our material wealth or worldly success, but our legacy will be measured by how much word did we put in our children. What values did we instill in them? What love did we give them? What commitment did we make to them? What memories did we create with them? The legacy we leave in their heart will endure long after we are gone. So the question I have, for all parents today is, what lessons are our children learning from us? What legacy are we going to leave for the next generation to follow? I would like all mothers to stand and I pray over you today. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for these incredible women who selflessly devote themselves to their families and we pray that you bless them abundantly, give them wisdom and strength as they navigate the challenges and the joys of raising their children. Give them patience and understanding. May they feel valued and loved and appreciated day and every day. Strengthen those who are raising their children on their own. Lead and guide mothers who are facing challenging circumstances. Comfort those who are missing their mothers today. And Lord, we thank you for blessing all mothers and we honor them today. We cherish them today, not only on this special day, but every day of the year in Jesus' name.